Hello. Welcome back to class. We haven't had a lecture in a week for this class because uh, we decided not to have one last week to give people a, a chance to work on the assignment and the project proposal. How's everyone doing? So let's take a look at where we are because we haven't been here in a while. Uh, today I'm going to talk about advanced game loops. Um, maybe I should have done this before, but it wasn't really necessary for any of our assignments. And so I wanted to leave that out until the last part. You can incorporate this into your project if you want, uh, but this is more of a thing that you'd want to do if you were building a quote-unquote real, uh, real game. So just remember, very important, the project proposal is due tonight. And so far, I only have five submissions and hopefully I have more than five groups left in the uh, in the course so make sure to get those in tonight they're very important because I have to be able to give you feedback uh, for what the scope of your project is and also uh, you have essentially one month from today to do the project so again yes the project does overlap with assignment four a little bit but that's fine because uh, Assignment 4 contains a lot of the stuff that you have to have for your project anyway. So by working on any of your assignments, you're pretty much also working on, on the project. Uh, someone had a question, just one person submitting per group, right? Yes. So one person submits your group's project proposal. There's no reason for multiple people to submit it. Okay, so anything else to mention? Hmm. If at any time you have any questions, uh, you can post them in the chat and I can get to them at a reasonable time. Uh, but, yeah, just to mention, uh, the project proposal is due tonight. So make sure you submit that by midnight on D2L, please. Alrighty. So let's see what we have today. We have lecture number 18. Wow, the course is in its like last two weeks. Uh, I don't know how everyone has found this term in terms of the, the time passing. Uh, at the beginning it was passing quite quickly, but it seems like it's getting a bit slower now, hey? Alright, so let's, let's just get into the PowerPoint for this lecture. Alright, lecture number 18, Advanced Game Main Loops. So uh, some of the material for these slides is available in one of the recommended textbooks, which is Game Programming Patterns. And so Game Programming Patterns, if you go to this website, um, you can find essentially what's covered in this lecture, but the lecture covers a little bit more. So please, uh, by all means, go ahead and, and read that and uh, you'll know more about game loops. And just before we get into this, just as... Almost any topic in computer science and game programming, this is not an this is not the only way to do something. Okay, so there's lots of different ways that you can implement uh, main game loops. This are these are just some of the ways that you can implement them in order to get around some of the the main problems that you might encounter when doing game design or game programming. So let's rewind a little bit before games and. To the point where you were just doing some, you know, first year console programming. So you may recall in previous years, uh, you just do some simpler console programs that you wrote to learn, uh, learn programming, right? So what you would maybe like a hello world and after hello world, you start doing some input parsing. And then after input parsing, maybe you do some file reading, stuff like that. So we're just talking about simple console programs. So those programs typically had the following structure. So first, you're going to run some initial code, right? So you've got your main method, something is going to happen when you run your main method. And then if the program is interactive at all, then you're going to print the instructions for the user somehow to the screen, right? So this may say, uh, enter a distance in feet, or please make a selection from the menu, or enter your name, or something like that. Just some way to get input from the user. After you've gotten, uh, sorry, so once you've printed the instructions, now you somehow program it so that you're waiting for input from the user, right? So you've said, okay, um, I'm gonna convert Celsius to Fahrenheit or something like that, and my program cannot progress 
until I've actually gotten the, the temperature in Celsius from the user that I want, okay? So you actually have to wait for the input from the user somehow. Once the user has input that user, or input that, uh, that value via the keyboard or the console or the mouse or however they do that, you have to store the, the input somehow. And then finally, you continue with the program code. So one example of this could be the following very, very simple program, right? So we're gonna store the input of the user in a floating point value. So that's this float input here. And then let's just say that this program is going to loop forever, right? We're gonna keep asking the user for more input and we're gonna keep programming things. So here, for example, is a very simple program where we're converting feet to inches. And you've probably done something like this in the past. So we're going to see out, right? We're going to ask the user, enter a distance in feet. And then we'll use see in to get that um, response from the user. So they'll type in whatever, like, I don't know, two feet, for example. And then we'll output that is, and of course, converting feet to inches is just multiplying by 12. And so if I entered two, it would say that is 24 inches. And then it would come back up here to the main, or to, sorry, to the while loop, and it would loop again and again and again until the user terminated the, the program somehow. And so this is just the simple program structure that we've used forever, and maybe even simpler would be not to have a loop, but to just do a one-time thing where you run it, enter a distance, and then it converts it for you. So the, the main structure of, of this program in an abstract sense looks something like the following. So we have our program, we're going to display some instructions to the user somehow, right? And then we're going to have some sort of loop uh, that we're going to continue for, for however long. And so it's going to wait for the user input, and this is blocking, okay? So if you haven't heard the term blocking before, it means that this line of code, until something triggers it, like an input, it will block the program from any further instructions, okay? So when you see blocking, it means that this line of code has some logic to it and it cannot progress, the, the program cannot progress at all until that logic is complete. So for example, on user input, on blocking user input, it says, please enter a, a distance in feet and the program will not do anything else. It won't progress past that line of code until you've, um, you've input something. So for example, over here, the C in, so where C out is printing out, C in, um, this statement right here is blocking. So in C++, if we get something from C in, we cannot progress past that line of code until the user actually types something and hits the return key. Okay, so that's what I mean by blocking. So after we've waited for the user input, then we do something interesting with that input, right? So we convert feet to inches or meters to feet or whatever we do. And then maybe we display more instructions or we quit based on the input, right? So for example, this might say uh, press Q to quit. And if the user pushed uh, Q down here, uh, then we parse that and we'd exit the program. So this is the, this is the main, you know, for these simple sort of console programs, you wait for some user input, you do something with that input, and then you display more instructions or you quit, right? So this is like the simplest main loop for a program that you could possibly imagine. Then graphical user interfaces came along. And so m even modern GUIs follow the same basic structure as what we just talked about. And that's because in, in some user interfaces, nothing is actually going to change unless the user inputs some values, right? So for example, let's take a, a really basic word processor. So the word processor is going to display the current document, right? So you've either opened a document or you've created a new document, and then you've just got a blank sheet in front of you. Maybe this could be a, a spreadsheet as well. So you've got something in front of you that you're looking at. And now that document isn't going to change unless the user inputs a value. Right, so you're, you're, unfortunately, your essay isn't gonna write itself, right? And so you don't have to update anything until the user has some sort of input there. 
And so this program may wait for the user to type or click somehow, and then it could handle the user input. So for example, you know, if you clicked on a certain part of the document, now the cursor will be flashing there. Or if you typed some keys, then those characters will go into the document and then repeat. Now, of course, more modern, like if you, if you open up modern Microsoft Word or LibreOffice or something like that, it's not going to be actually blocking, right? It's, they've got threaded stuff going on. It, it's quite complicated, but let's talk about like a basic word processor. So you can have blocking input even in a user interface. So what would that look like in code? So it's basically the same thing. So you display the current screen of the user interface. So this might be the document uh, that you're looking at or a PDF file or whatever. Uh, and then while true, you wait for some user input. In this case, now you could have mouse input, right? Or you could have keyboard input, etc. And then you update the internal variables based on that input. And then you display the current screen again. And so that's what's happening in most graphical user interfaces. Now, of course, like I said, most GUI APIs now are multi-threaded, and so it's a little bit more complex than this. But at a basic level, this is what, what is happening. But unlike other programs like your Celsius to Fahrenheit converter or your basic word processor, um, games keep moving even when the user doesn't input anything, right? So the game is not going to get paused just because the user isn't doing anything. Now, of course, if you're playing a game of chess or, or something like that with no clock, maybe, yeah, the, the game is waiting for your user input. But in general, video games are still moving even if you're not inputting anything. So, for example, the game world clock keeps ticking, right? Time in the game keeps passing. NPCs keep moving around. Animations keep animating. And so the key here is that in video games, we don't wait for user input, right? So it's not blocking. And you may say, like, why am I going over all this? We've done this before. Well, we will get to some new stuff. I'm just sort of framing all this, um, giving the context for it. So what we do in our game loop, then, is we display some initial screen, right? And then we have some loop that we've seen already in the course. And the key difference here is that we process user input if any exists. So we're not waiting for the user to type a phrase or click a button. We are just... The game is going to be simulating, and here we're going to check to see, hey, did the user press a key or click the mouse on the last frame, right? That will be in our SFML event queue if we're using SFML. And so if there's no events, we're not blocking here. So the, the very important thing is this line, this first one, is no longer blocking. So if any, uh, if any input exists, we're going to update the internal game simulation based on that. If no user input exists, then we're still going to update the simulation. And then what we do is we render the current game screen. Okay? So uh, this is the basic uh, structure to any game main loop. And if we take out, you know, if we make this sort of functional, then what we're going to do is we're going to render the screen once, we're going to display it somehow. And then while true, we're going to process the input, we're going to do an update, and then we're going to do a render. Okay, and if we if we blow this open into something that sort of looks like our assignments, then we have something like this. So we're going to have an update function, right, which gets called once per frame. And essentially, uh, we're going to call our user input system, right? Now we've switched away from this. This is no longer exactly how our, how our scenes look because we've changed to an action-based system, but this is essentially how our game is working. We first process the user input, then we update the simulation step by one, and the updating of the simulation step might involve, you know, updating the entity manager, ticking the AI, moving the players, updating the lifespan, the collisions, etc. And then the rendering happens down here where we may update the animations or we update the rendering, for example, okay? So we have this process the input, update the game state, and then render the game state. And this is our main loop that keeps looping and looping and looping. So, what about game loop speed then? How is, how is that gonna, gonna work out? So when programs use blocking input, they can run the main loop at any speed since it is limited by the user input speed. So what that means is, 
If you have a program like your Celsius to Fahrenheit converter or your word processor, if you are using blocking input, then you really don't need to worry about like how fast your program is running because you're really limited by the speed that the user can input something, right? So if, we're, if our Celsius to Fahrenheit converter took a second or two, it's really not gonna matter much because it's waiting there for the user input anyway, and the user input is definitely the limiting factor in terms of how, how fast that program is running. But when you're using non-blocking input for something like a video game loop, we now need to decide how fast the loop spins. Right? So if we look over here, this update loop, well, if there's no user input, then this is essentially just running as fast as possible, right? And so we, as the game designer, now have to talk about, well, how fast do I want this loop to update, right? Because, for example, if I'm processing input and updating and rendering without any blocking, then my, my game is going to run faster like my character might run faster on a faster computer than it will on a slower computer. So how am I gonna deal with, with stuff like that? So each update is going to advance the game world by the same amount each call, right? So for example, in our assignment so far, we've, we've had a variable called speed for the player, for example. So if the speed is set to five, then on each game tick, like each game frame, uh, we're going to update our x value by 5, for example, right? So this is the game world clock ticking forward by 1. And so we've gotten like one tick of the game world clock, one update function. But the player's real world clock ticks at a different speed, right? What I mean is my the, the, the speed of the universe is different from the speed of the in-game clock. And so... How many game loops per cycle, or how many game loop cycles in one second is going to determine the game's frames per second count? Okay, now this might seem obvious, but it does have real ramifications. So for example, up here, if I'm using a fixed step update for each update cycle of my game's main loop, then if I'm running it on a faster computer, then I'm adding a fixed amount faster than I would be on a slower computer. And so that is going to make the game actually feel different and run different. Not just like laggy or choppy or whatever, but the player is actually going to be moving faster or slower based on the speed of the computer. Now, you know, back in the days of like the NES, they didn't really have to worry about that because as long as they made the game run at the proper speed for the NES, then they know that that game's only going to run on the NES. So they don't have to worry about faster NESs or slower NESs. But on computers, we have vastly different hardware, and so we do have to think about this problem. So, frames per second. How does that work? So, we're going to do the same thing as before, where we display the initial screen, and then we loop, we process the input, we update, and we render. And so, for example, if we just happen to have 60 of these loops per second, then that would be 60 render calls per second, and that would be... 60 frames per second that you would see on your computer, okay? So when we talk about frames per second, we're talking about the rendering calls. So graphically, more frames per second equals smoother play, right? And so we would want to have the most frames per second possible. Now, you know, we won't get into the argument of how many frames per second the human eye can actually observe, but it's probably up to somewhere like 300, right? So if we if we could play at 60 frames per second, we would probably want to do that over, say, 30 frames per second. So FPS, FPS, you know, frames per second, not first-person shooter, is typically determined by two things, okay? The first thing that determines FPS is how much work is done on each loop and how fast is the underlying hardware, right? So if, we, if all we do is multiply our you know, Celsius by the Fahrenheit conversion formula, we can run that at like, I don't know, hundreds of millions of ticks per second, right? But that's also scaled by the underlying hardware. If I ran that on a Commodore 64, it's going to be different than on a, I don't know, 10700X or whatever, whatever is out there. So older games 
had sometimes had the advantage of knowing the exact hardware it would run on. So I talked about this with the NES. So they knew how fast the game would run. But modern computer games must run on a variety of hardware. And so we actually have to accommodate that now, right? Now, we probably know some range of hardware. Like, for example, if you buy a game um, and it says like, okay, here's the minimum hardware specs. You've got to have this sort of processor um, and you've got to have this amount of RAM, this sort of video card. So we know kind of at the bottom end what that might be, but there's going to be a factor of maybe up to like five or six times processing speed in the range of hardware that this game should run on. And so we've got to deal with that somehow. So the flexibility that you have with your game loop can depend on many factors, all right? And, and these factors are important, but we won't go into detail with them in this course because they're a bit, a bit outside the scope of this course. So for example, your operating system, how often can you pull events, right? So if you're talking about, okay, my operating system might only be able to pull events 10 times a second, then your game is gonna feel really weird. Um, maybe your operating system actually has input events be blocking, or maybe they're not blocking, etc. Maybe your monitor is the limiting factor. So maybe you can't render more than your monitor refresh rate. So if we talk about things like vertical sync, um, you know, if your monitor is 60 hertz, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to render the game at more than 60 frames per second. Maybe networking comes into play as well. So the type of net traffic um, can determine timeouts, packet loss, etc. And we're not touching networking with a 10-foot pole in this course, but it can have an, impa an impact on, on what you're able to do inside your game engine. So let's talk about, first, the simplest problem, which is how do we set a fixed frame per second counter, okay? How would we actually do that? So let's say we want to fix the game to 60 frames per second. And so just a quick note, We've done this already in the course, but we've cheated, right? So we've let SFML do this for us with a built-in command, and we can say, hey, Mr. Window, set the frame limit to 60 frames per second. And again, this does not say that our game will definitely run at 60 frames per second, right? There's not a magical command that just says this will be 60 frames per second. This says it is going to run at a maximum of 60 frames per second, right? So all we can ever do in any game engine, for any computer, for any hardware, is set a maximum, right? We cannot set a minimum, it's impossible. Because if your code is just terribly inefficient and really slow, and it takes a second or more to do your, your frame updates, you can't run at 60 frames a second, right? So what this does is it says, do not run any faster than 60 frames per second. So if we want to do this manually, instead of just cheating and calling the SML version, SFML version, we must limit our game loop to run at most 16 milliseconds per frame, okay? And we will. what we're going to do to accomplish this is we will add a delay to the end of the game loop. And so what does that look like? It's gonna look like the following. So what we're going to do every frame is we're going to process the input, we're going to update the game, we're going to do the rendering, and then what we'll do is we'll wait, right? So let's say that we want to run at a maximum of 60 frames per second. So uh, here, 60 frames per second is about 16 milliseconds, okay? It's a little bit more. So what we have to do here, let's say, let me just draw on the screen here. So let's say it took one millisecond to process the input. Let's say it took three milliseconds to update the game engine. And then it took two milliseconds to render, okay? So how long do we have to wait? Well, that will be 16 minus one minus three minus two. And so here I would have to put a delay of 10 milliseconds. So that's how I would accomplish that. You add up the amount of time it took to do everything in that frame. And then over here, you wait the remainder, okay? So if I wanted my game to run at 30 frames per second, instead of 16 milliseconds, this would be, I don't know, 33.3 .3 milliseconds or something like that. So we would have to wait 33 minus that. So that'd be what, 27 milliseconds? We would have to wait if our game was running at 30 frames per second. 
And you can see here that if like, let's say my game update took uh, 23 milliseconds to update, then I would have uh, 26 milliseconds per frame. And 26 milliseconds per frame is not 60 frames per second. And so if this happens, we can't run at 60 frames per second, right? And not only that, but we can't run at 60 frames per second and our game is gonna be slower, right? So if our game is, is updating not often enough, then our character is actually going to be moving slower through the game. So let's just look at what, what we would actually do to implement that. Someone asked in the chat, how hard would it to be to display an FPS counter in our game? Really simple. So if we wanted an FPS counter, all we would have to do, <coughs> excuse me, would count the number of renders we did each second and then draw it to the screen. That's really input, that's really easy. Someone else asked, the wait time would be variable though, as process input, update game, etc. stop, uh, steps time might change. Yeah, exactly, right? So maybe on, uh, on one count here, right? So my first example here had this taking six milliseconds. On the next one, it might take five milliseconds. On the next one, it might take 10 milliseconds. On the next one, it might take two milliseconds, right? But the whole point is, as long as this, as long as the sum of this is less than 16, we're fine. We can still run at 60 frames per second. Because over here, all we do is we take the, the 16 milliseconds, we subtract how long this took, and we wait that the rest of the duration. And so to the user, they have no idea if this frame was running slower than another frame as long as it's under 16 milliseconds. All right. So there's a few more questions out there, but they're not really relevant. So I recommend watching the lectures for the course to get the answers to those questions. So what does that diagram look like in actual code? Okay. Well, the first line here, we're going to calculate the number of milliseconds per frame that we, that we have to compute, right? So over here, we have a thousand milliseconds. That's, you know, a thousand milliseconds is one second. And we divide that by the number of seconds. So this will come out to be 16.66 or 33 or something like that. I can't remember. Then we have our game loop right here. So the first line of the game loop, uh, we're going to say, we're going to record the starting time, right? So if we have some function here, which is like get current time milliseconds, that is going to be the start of, of this game loop. Then we process the user input, we do the update, we do the rendering, and then we're going to calculate how much time elapsed. Right? So the time elapsed is how long it took us to do these three steps. So we're going to say, okay, get the current time in milliseconds again, and then subtract the starting time in milliseconds, right? So if the starting time in milliseconds was, I don't know, 100, and the current time is 110, then we would have spent 10 milliseconds doing this. And so what we can do then is we're going to sleep somehow, right? Now, whether this is a threaded sleep or a busy loop or however we implement that, I'm not gonna get into that. But we're going to sleep, and what sleep means is just do nothing, okay? So blocking do nothing here. And we're going to sleep for a duration of the number of milliseconds that I want per frame minus the elapsed time, okay? So if this took, again, if this took 10 milliseconds, we would sleep for six. If this took three milliseconds, we'd sleep for 13. If this took 20 milliseconds, then we can't sleep for a negative amount, so there would just be no sleep, right? So if one of these frames took too long, then the sleep doesn't even occur. Okay. So adding the sleep, <coughs> geez, excuse me, at the end of the loop ensures that we won't update too quickly, right? So all this does is it sets a maximum frames per second. It doesn't set a minimum frames per second, it sets a maximum frames per second. So it ensures that we don't update too quickly. But unfortunately, there is no magical way to ensure that the slow code doesn't make your game run too slowly. All right. So in this case, we must cut computation time to ensure that the FPS target can be reached. 
So what I mean by that is if we look at the slide that we just looked at, this update function here, usually the input processing is not going to be the bottleneck. Usually the rendering isn't going to be the bottleneck, but it could be. If you're trying to draw, you know, 100,000 things on the screen, then maybe rendering would be the bottleneck. But usually it's going to be things like AI calculations, physics calculations, stuff like that. And so this could still be too slow sometimes, right? And there's no way to get around that. You can't magically make your game run faster. You need to go and optimize that code, or you need to take features out of your code that make it run faster, okay? So just gonna read this about what SFML actually does. So the SF window function set frame limit, it limits the frame rate to a maximum. So here is what's actually um, printed in the API. So if a limit is set, the window will use a small delay after each call to display to ensure that the current frame lasted long enough to match the frame rate limit. SFML will try to match the given limit as much as it can, but since it internally uses SF sleep, whose precision depends on the underlying operating system, the results may be a little unprecise as well. So for example, you may be getting 65 frames per second when requesting 60 frames per second. And so it, it depends on like, how accurate your system clock is and how accurate this sleep setting is, right? But in theory, in theory, not in practice, but in theory, this should set an exact maximum of 60 frames per second. Okay. Alrighty. So now we're gonna talk about game simulation scaling, which is one possible way that we could do something really interesting. So the problem we face is the following. Each update advances the game time by some amount, right? So the game time is like the clock in the game world, how fast the clock is ticking. And it takes some real amount of time to compute that, right? So it might take a millisecond, it might take five milliseconds. If if step two takes longer than step one, then the game slows down, right? So for example, if it takes longer than 16 milliseconds to update our game world by its equivalent of 16 milliseconds, then we can't keep up, right? We're going to be slowing things down. So if we could ad advance the game world by more on each frame, then what we could do is update less frequently and keep the game up to date. So what does that mean? So the idea here is to introduce a variable that we will use to update the game world simulation. And this is called a variable time step, okay? So what does that mean? Well, what it means is the following. So let me go over this code and then I'll, I'll, I'll show an example. So we're going to record the, uh, a variable called last time. And last time, we're gonna see what that does, okay? But we're gonna set it to the current time in milliseconds as the initial variable. Then we're gonna have our game loop. So we're going to say current equals current milliseconds, okay? So this is the current time in milliseconds. And then the elapsed amount of time is going to be the current time minus the last time. Oh, this is not a function, sorry. Let me. Uh, let me update that real quick. Okay, so what this, what this does is that last time was going, we're going to record when the last frame ended. So this is essentially a, an amount of time that it computes how long the last frame that we computed took to compute in real world time. So that's what elapsed is. Then we're going to process user input. And then now, instead of just calling update, we're going to pass in the amount of time that elapsed on the previous frame. And then we're going to render. And then we're going to, at the very end, say last time equals current. And so what this does is the following. So each frame, we're going to calculate how much real time has passed since the last game update. Okay, so instead of just doing this thing where we sleep each time, 
we're going to actually calculate, okay, the last game frame took a certain amount of time to update. And when we update the game state, we're going to use the real elapsed time as a scaling variable. And so for example, uh, let's say we have a bullet flying through the air. Each time step, we're going to update it with the velocity. But with, with variable time steps, so with this example, okay, we're going to scale that velocity with the amount of elapsed time. So, so what does that actually do? Well, it's going to mean that if our last game frame lagged a little bit, so let's say our last game frame took a second to calculate instead of 10 milliseconds or something, right? Maybe there was a hiccup in the hardware, maybe there was some really slow calculation. So let's say that each time step uh, normally, does this, yeah, this appears, okay. Each time step, normally our bullet is going to be ticking along like this, right? So it's gonna maybe go five, 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 five frames or five pixels for frame. Now let's say that we had one frame, like if this frame here, let's say it took one second to calculate or it, it lagged a little bit. What this time delay is going to do is it's going to say, okay, well, I was ticking along at this rate, right? So here, here's how fast I was ticking along. And then there was like one frame that took a super long time to calculate. And so there were no updates in here. And so what we may want to do is say, well, I want the game simulation to sort of catch up to that lag. And so rather than have the next frame render, you know, what it would have been on the next time step and just go another five pixels and you'd actually see that lag, then what happens is on the next time step, we're going to simulate a bunch of time into the future in order to catch up to where we should be if that lag hadn't happened, right? So how do I, how do, I do this like physically? Okay, so let's say I have my hand here, right? And every frame, my hand is moving by a specific amount. So let's say it's just moving across, moving across, moving across, and then we lag. Let's say we lag for a full second. Now, what this problem is trying to solve is when that lag is up, do I want my hand to just start moving from where it was? Or do I want to, to have it so that it catches up? Oh geez, I just hit the mic. What, do I want it so that it catches up to where it should have been if the lag didn't happen? Okay, so that's what we're trying to do here. And this scaling can make that happen. So the advantages to this is that the game is going to play at a consistent rate on different hardware. And it's going to have a variable frames per second and players with faster machines are going to get smoother FPS, okay? And I see some questions in the chat and I'm about to answer your questions. Here's some, here's some disadvantages to this. You're going to have non-deterministic effects based on your variable FPS. So some people asked, wouldn't this mess up our physics and collision detection if elapsed had large discrepancies? Wouldn't that cause complication with hit recognitions? Yes, 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 yes. All of those things, okay? So floating, not only that, but floating point errors produce different results, okay? So for example, if I had, um, I'll, I'll talk about floating point error in a second. Uh, if I had a network desynchronization, that could be caused by this. Physics simulations could real diff yield different results, right, with collisions and stuff. So for example, if I did have that case, like let's say I had a big obstacle right here, right, and my bullet is flying along at, you know, some predetermined rate, which means that it can't pass through this obstacle, and then we get some lag here, and then I use that, and now, now my, my thing is over here, it could skip through the wall, right? And so this is one possible solution, but it's not a solution that you should probably use in all, in all cases. So if we go back to that, this elapsed here, you could even have floating point errors. So let's say, for example, right, that uh, we have two scenarios. In one scenario, it took 40 milliseconds now let let's uh let's let's hmm okay let's say in one scenario it took 10 milliseconds and and this 10 is going to be exactly a 10 right now or 
maybe that got split up into like 4.3 and uh, 5.7. Oh God, can't draw. So if one computer had took 10 milliseconds and another computer took a 4.3 millisecond and a 5.7 millisecond, these numbers cannot be stored exactly as floating point numbers, right? And so the outcome of the simulation will actually be different because of that. And so one game is going to have a, like actually different collisions than another, or it's the same game running on two different sets of hardware. The differences are, uh, the collisions could be different, all right? So that's, that's one possible solution, but there are definite disadvantages to this, okay? Definitely a lot of disadvantages. So how does rendering fit into all of this as well? And we'll go back in a bit and we'll, we'll fix this. So whether or not we use variable time steps, rendering is not affected at all, okay? So rendering essentially just takes the current state of the game and it draws it. Right, so however we update the current state of the game, rendering is not going to care about that. So how about this? Instead of variably updating the game simulation, instead of that, let's render at variable times. Okay, so instead of trying to say, I'm gonna scale the game simulation, Let's say, maybe I could delay the rendering, or I could put the rendering at different places. So, this is going to let us go back to fixed game time steps, right? Which is great, because then we have deterministic results, and so we know that our collision is going to work, etc. And so this is what that is going to look like, okay? What we're going to do is we're going to process the input, and then we're going to do a variable number of game updates and based on those game updates we're going to render after that sorry not based on it but we're going to do a variable number of game updates and then after that number of game updates has been done then we're going to do the rendering and this is what a lot of game engines actually do so I've got some code here that I'm gonna show and then I'll, I'll explain it using some examples okay so we've got float previous equals current time milliseconds. So previous is going to store when the previous frame of computation finished. And we're going to do that to calculate lag, essentially. Um, we've got a lag variable here, and the lag is going to essentially be how, how much longer did the previous frame take to calculate than I wanted it to take. So for example, if, if I have 16 milliseconds per frame as my desired computation speed, and I take 30 milliseconds for one frame, then 30 minus 16, this is going to be 14 milliseconds of lag, okay? So now we have our game main loop, and we're going to calculate the current time. We always wanna know the current time because that's when the current frame started computing, okay? So we say the elapsed amount of time is current minus the previous. Then we're going to set previous equal to current, and lag plus equals elapsed. Okay, so what lag is actually storing here is this is the amount of time that the last frame took, okay? And if that went over, then there's going to be, the lag is going to be calculated in there. Then we're going to process the input and we're going to say while the lag is still greater than the number of milliseconds per update, do the update function, and then subtract the milliseconds per frame from the lag. Now, what this does is it, and let me just finish, so then we'll do the rendering, okay? So here is where we do a variable number of update steps, okay? So what does this actually do? And you can go back and look at this slide and parse it a bit. But what it does is lag measures essentially how far behind the game's clock is behind the real world clock. So for example, if one of our updates or renderings took too long, then we are essentially, we've been lagged somehow. That inner loop is going to do a variable amount of updates 
so that the game catches up until all of the lag is gone with fixed steps update, which are accurate. And then once we catch up, we render the scene. But the good thing is, is that the game simulates at a constant rate using fixed time steps in a safe way to catch up for these lag frames. So we may have some frames where the rendering appears choppy, right, while we catch up, but at least the simulation speed is now fixed on different hardware. And importantly, we can only catch up if the lag frames are infrequent. So here's a really good real world analogy of exactly what's happening, okay? So you work in a fast food place. So your boss comes along and says, you have to make one cheeseburger every minute, okay? So you gotta make a cheeseburger a minute because that's how, how fast we need to go to fulfill our orders today. So at the end of the day, they're gonna check the number of minutes you worked and divide that by the number of cheeseburgers, right? So. Let's say it takes you 15 seconds to actually make a cheeseburger, right? So you have a 45 second rest in between making each cheeseburger. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna get all the ingredients, you're gonna make the cheeseburger, it takes 15 seconds, and then you can just sit there and you can wait for 45 seconds, right? Then after the 45 seconds, you can make another cheeseburger. And that takes 15 seconds, and then you can chill for another 45 seconds. But one time, your burger you drop the lettuce on the ground and now you got foot lettuce, right? And so you need to clean it off, you need to do whatever. And so one, one burger lags somehow and it takes you two minutes to clean it up. So now you're behind by two burgers, right? But since you can make four burgers per minute, on the next frame, you can make three burgers and you can catch up, right? Yes, I know, gross foot lettuce. Um, just a meme. So you see how this works? If you can make more than one burger per, per minute, then if one of your burger making minutes lags, you can make more burgers on the next minute to catch up. So that's what this is doing, right? That's exactly what this is doing. It's saying that if one frame took too long to calculate if our update function can actually you know on average calculate much faster than 16 milliseconds per frame let's say it takes two milliseconds then we could potentially catch up eight frames in one render okay so the assumption here yes as someone pointed out is that your burger making speed is less than the burgers per minute Right? So if this update function takes exactly 16 milliseconds, then you can never catch up. Right? You're just, you're just doomed. And you can never catch up. Um, because there's no magical way to make your code run faster, but we can arbitrarily make it run slower. All right? So that's what this method does. So, the important thing here is that we've now removed rendering synchronization from update. So we are no longer doing, we're no longer doing one render per game world update. And this means if we wanted to, we could put rendering in another thread. Why not? We could do that. We're not going to do it in this course, but you could do that if you wanted to. Um, but some issues can arise from that. Okay. So for example, if you completely decoupled it, you could render between updates and that could be messy, whatever. And so, you know, if this, if this gets really weird, like maybe you do, maybe you're trying to do two updates per frame, right? So you do an update and then an update and then a render. Update, update, render. But uh-oh, if we don't take care of this somehow, we may be doing renderings in the middle of updates. And so make sure that you, you, you take care of that if you end up doing that. So depending on how we implement this, if we render between updates, the game world could be the same for two frames, which could look choppy, okay? But what some people do in some game engines, I'm not telling you to do this, is that they actually interpolate, to interpolate or do basic movement calculations inside the rendering engine, okay? So you can actually pass variables inside the rendering engine and do like 
approximations of stuff like this. And so the physics may not be exact for that render, but the game engine will eventually catch up. And so what that's saying is, if your actual physics update took too long, rather than render the same frame multiple times in a row and see this sort of lag happening or choppy rendering, you could maybe simulate what should have happened. And, and anyway, that similar things can happen um, in networking, which I won't get into too much, but just, just to let you know, uh, let's say that you you have like a one second lag in a first person shooter, right? So I remember playing Quake in 1996 with a 500 ping, 500 ping, and it was glorious. This is, this is my generation's version of I used to walk home in a 10 feet of snow uphill, right? So I played on a, like a 12800 modem connecting to some private server in like, I don't know, North Carolina or something like that, 500 ping. And the original Quake engine if you had a 500 ping, if you pressed walk forward, your your game wouldn't do anything for half a second. And that sucked, right? You had to basically like pre-plan seconds in advance what you were going to be doing. And so like the only time you could hit someone is if they were in the sky, if they were, if they were jumping because you could sort of interpolate anyway, it was bad. But what happens in modern FPS games is if you have like half a second of lag, your character will still be responding to your inputs and moving around on your screen as if you had no lag. So what's happening there is your system is doing something similar to this where locally you are updating your game simulation. And then as soon as you get a response from the server, the real update actually happens, okay? So this is done differently in every game engine. I'm not saying it happens exactly like this, but this sort of catch up and rollback, yeah, someone just said rollback in the chat, is, is what's happening, and we could do an entire course on that topic, but we are certainly not going to, okay? However, here's something we talked about in the past. Game speed and collision issues. Given our basic, given our basic way of doing collision detection so far, an entity going fast enough could pass through a game tile, right? Or it could pass through a bullet. And we saw this before, where the example is, if I have a bullet here, right, and it's updating at this amount of time per, per frame, and I have a really skinny uh, wall, it could pass through the wall, right? That could happen. And so we sort of fixed this in assignment three by setting a maximum speed for our entity. So I had a really janky fix for this in assignment three, and it was, well, we know all of our walls are gonna have 32 thickness or more. And so if we set our speed, our maximum speed to 20, then we can never fall, we can never go through it, right? Now this is like, you know, a lot of people do this sort of hacky fix, but ideally we wouldn't have to do something like that. And so as long as the maximum speed is less than the thickness of the smallest tile, that works. It just works, so we could just do that. But what if we wanted to allow our entities to go way faster, right? So if we have a bullet that's like super fast or a homing missile that has the catch, I don't know. If we wanted something to go at a faster speed than that, how would we do it? Well, one way is how we just said. One solution is to increase the number of game ticks per second. And a game tick here is the update loop, right? So let's say we wanted the max speed of the player to be 100 pixels per frame. If we had a fixed tile size of 32, then 100 could jump over one of those tiles and miss a collision check. So what we could do is instead of doing one update at 100 pixels per frame, we could do four updates at 25 pixels per frame. And as long as our update function takes less than, I don't know, four milliseconds, so we could do four of them at 60 frames per second, then we could do this, okay? So we're trading CPU effort for simulation accuracy. And if I go back, two, 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 two. so here, um, this is saying, oh, actually, sorry. Where is it? No. 
there, right? So instead of doing one of these, right, one of these game updates at 100, we could do four of them at 25, okay? And that's one way that we could implement this sort of behavior. Now, you may think, oh, this is like, and also, this is really good because it actually lets us chop things up into integers and now our update will be like identical. So if we did four at 25, it would actually be the same as 100 pixels per frame, but we just solve our issues. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play a YouTube video because I wanna show an actual example of this happening. And I'm gonna put in my headphones while I do this because I'll have sound. All right. Now, I recommend watching all of these videos because these videos are incredible and they're from Pan and Coke and Pan and Coke does like PhD thesis work worth of work in his YouTube videos. Uh, it's absolutely crazy. Um, so let's go to this example which exactly demonstrates what it is that I wanted to talk about. Okay. So I have to turn on my de I'm going to turn on my desktop audio and I'm going to mute my mic and we're going to watch this four minute YouTube video. And I'm going to turn off my camera for that. I couldn't save that. Oh, oh my God. Never mind. Dear Lord, die. I'm missing a coin. I'm missing a coin. Where? Where did I miss a coin?
All right. So that YouTube channel is absolutely incredible. Um, and you can see these sort of, you know, quote unquote, janky solutions of like, oh, 78 pixels wide is our walls or floors or whatever. So we'll just set our maximum movement speed to 78. That was used in Mario 64, right? So it's not, it's not just us who's doing stuff like that. Everyone has these sorts of problems. So I highly recommend, um, it's really interesting actually. If I can just, so if anyone wants to watch that, let me copy these links into the chat. So that's the first video. The second link is um, walls, floors, and ceilings. And this actually talks about how Super Mario 64 did its walls, floors, and ceilings. And it's so genius. It's, you, it's crazy. It's really cool how well it worked and the interesting bugs that can come from that. And then after you've uh, consumed that content and you haven't seen it before, you can uh, you can go look at the parallel universes video, which is just it's it's a meme at this point. But it's like I know people who have done PhD theses who have done less work than this guy puts into his Mario sixty four videos, right? So absolutely incredible. I highly recommend going and watching these videos. Uh, so remember, please, um, that the uh, so we just covered the game loops lecture. Uh, you do not have to do any of that for your project if you don't want to, okay? Um, but if you do, that's fine. Um, it, it won't be worth bonus marks on the project, but if you do have some frames that are like making your game lag a bit, you can use these techniques in order to help you catch up. Uh, the order of the rest of our lectures is not in order. We may be doing shaders next time. I just have to prepare um, that lecture. Uh, but we do have several interesting topics coming up. That, that will be used on the project. So, remember that the project proposal is due tonight, and I've only gotten five of them so far, so please get that in as soon as possible. And with that, I will see you on Thursday.